Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… In the middle of the 20th century, people across the United States called for the closure of mental asylums. Stories of horrific abuse emerged from asylums nationwide. But what happens when you forcibly shut down all of the asylums at once? America found out, and it wasn't pleasant. The murders of a 21-year-old woman and a 16-year-old girl are found to be connected, but only after 30 years, and there might possibly be a third victim connected as well. U.S. Senator Marco Rubio says UFOs could pose a threat to national security. Could he be right? Or is he off his rocker? A girl is possessed by the spirit of her dead grandfather, and he forces her to do penance for his wrongdoings. But first, different races were present on Earth in the distant past. We cannot deny this. But some of the races were quite strange, a bit too strange to be believed. Are we trying to erase perhaps thousands of years in our history just because the facts do not fit in our history books? We begin with that story. While listening, be sure to check out the Weird Darkness website. At WeirdDarkness.com you can find paranormal and horror audiobooks I've narrated, watch old horror movies for free, Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Ancient and prehistoric rock art, found in thousands of places throughout the world, undoubtedly had its purpose and meaning, even if it's difficult to interpret it and understand the intentions of ancient artists. Nevertheless, hours of observations are not needed to see our ancestors tried to convey an important message to future generations. Ancient civilizations used a variety of ways – myths, cave paintings, artifacts, and more to tell us about the world they lived in. Their story is intriguing, and based on what we're about to find out, it's clear – mysterious, unknown beings walked the Earth with humans. Who were they? Where did they come from, and why were they so important to our ancestors? Unlocking the meaning and significance of these ancient images is a complex, problem-ridden task and in most cases, it will always remain an open book. For no matter how refined the technology at our disposal becomes, we cannot enter the minds of the creators, and thus we can never satisfactorily know what motivated them to produce art in stone, according to John Vincent Beleza, a great explorer, pilgrim, and the foremost specialist in the cultural history of Upper Tibet. Painted or carved-on rock images represent a chronicle of daily life in the distant past, special events, and habits of our ancestors, and those who lived on Earth but were not humans. Many ancient legends have been passed on through the ages, orally, and they too confirm those facts. Different races were present on Earth in the distant past. Were some of these individuals visitors from other star systems? or from our planet's mysterious subterranean realms? As mentioned in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, the race of giants lived on Earth in ancient times before Noah's flood. 
Also, the second book of Samuel, chapter 21, verse 20, mentions a giant, a Rephaim, a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he also was born to the giant, described as having six toes and six fingers. Unearthed remains of giant people prove without any doubt that giants did live at the same time in the past. Also, carvings on the granite walls depicting feet with six toes or hands with six fingers confirm the giant's very existence on Earth. A gene of the giants is still present with us, and it determines even today how many fingers and toes you have. Among Warani Indians from the Amazonian region of Ecuador, there are people with six fingers and six toes. They are not people of gigantic size, but they demonstrate some typical physical characteristic of a giant race, such as six toes, six fingers, and even double dentition. The Jornada Mogollon prehistoric Indian culture, of which there are no known modern descendants today, made thousands of rock carvings in the area of the Three Rivers, New Mexico. Among them, there is one depicting a hand with six fingers. The hand reaches toward the sky with a wavy design over it. A snake? The Milky Way? Celestial designs are to the right. Below is another hand with only five fingers, according to Niall Root, an expert on petroglyphs. Did the hand belong to a shaman or someone else considered to be a superman in the eyes of the ancients? Gods, pharaohs, goddesses and high priests and other important figures of pharaonic times were often depicted in the bas-reliefs on the temple walls of stone buildings in ancient Egypt. One of such bas-reliefs, found on one of many decorated walls of the Egyptian temple, depicts someone with six fingers, holding some kind of pointing stick that probably was a kind of magic wand. Who was he? Was he a powerful Egyptian ruler? A priest or perhaps a magician holding an attribute of power in his hand? Was it a magical weapon similar to a magic cop, a thunder weapon possessed by Bep Kororoti? According to one legend, he used to demonstrate his power by raising his magical weapon and pointing it first at a tree and then at a stone, and destroyed them both. Once upon a time, shining golden airships from a distant star system appeared in the sky. The ancient spacemen arrived in the area. They had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. The earth shook and thunder echoed over the hills. The strangers in the golden ships looked like humans with fine features, white skin, bluish-black hair, and thick beards. They, as if by magic, suspended the heaviest stones, flung lightning and melted rocks, says a remarkable story as told to a German photojournalist, Karl Brueger, in 1972. The story inspired Brueger to write a very controversial book entitled Chronicle of Akekor, published in 1976. Soon after, Karl Brueger was murdered. Was Brueger's mysterious death related to the secret knowledge of Akekor he possessed? The ancestors of the present-day natives of Argentina and Peru came from the north. They were men of a white race. Today, there are still a few survivors of these people, and they are pure white. Their name is the Euros of Lake Titicaca. They existed before the sun, when the earth was still dark and cold. These mysterious beings claim that their ancestors were builders of Tiwanaku's civilization. The first inhabitants of the region had also six fingers. The legends reveal that they were not quite the same as men who came after the sun. Who were those mysterious Euros people? keepers of secrets much older than Machu Picchu? The local Indians believed that their blood was black and they could neither be struck by lightning nor drown. They finally disappeared because they disobeyed the gods' orders and mixed with humans. According to the pictographic writings from the region of Tiwanaku some five million years ago, when there was as yet no humans on Earth but only gigantic animals, a large and shiny spacecraft landed on the Island of the Sun in the middle of the Lake Titicaca. 
Its crewmen represented a race of man-like beings with blood different from ours. They came to settle in the region of the lake. The purpose of their visitation was the insemination of human intelligence. Among them was a female, human-like being who stepped down from the spaceship. She resembled a woman from her breasts to her feet, but she was not of human origin. She had a conical head, long ears, and webbed hands with only four fingers. As ancient records say, she was named Origona, or Big Ears, and came from Venus, where the atmospheric conditions are not unlike those on Earth, but where water was abundant, and to this kind of environment the mysterious female creature had her webbed feet. One day, having fulfilled her task, the alien female creature re-entered the spaceships and traveled to her home planet. Many legends of Central and South America mention white-skinned gods who came from across the ocean. There are also references to the first men living on Easter Island, the survivors of the world's first race who had shining bodies and huge ears, although their lobes were not stretched. Some other records mention mysterious early tribes the Long Ears, who were about 2.5 meters or 8 feet tall and had white skin and red hair. Later, following tradition, the Inca nobles had a custom of deforming their earlobes by hanging heavy ornaments from them. It's worth mentioning that depictions of people with long ears can be found in the regions of East and South Pacific Ocean, Peru, and India. An enigma surrounds this vanished white race of beings and their past on the planet Earth. The legends say that they came by boat from a land that lies behind America. Did they arrive on Earth from space and later moved in their boats to chosen destinations? They must have been present on Earth a very long time ago, but the question is, when? Long ears individuals are depicted on many bas-reliefs on Angkor Wat, all ancient depictions of gods of Japan, India, and China show mysterious long ears. So we ask, are we trying to erase perhaps thousands of years in our history just because the facts do not fit in our history books? This episode is dedicated to the men and women of our armed forces and first responders. Whether you are currently serving or have served in the past, you are appreciated. It is because of your courage and sacrifice that we enjoy the freedoms and liberties we hold dear. And I, for one, appreciate every single one of you for protecting what many of us take for granted. So thank you. From the 1850s to the 1980s, large state-run psychiatric facilities housed most of America's citizens with mental illness. This practice began to change in the 1960s when legislation dismantled the state-run asylum system, replacing it with a community-based care policy that ultimately failed as well. Support for closing asylums and transitioning to community-based care facilities or outpatient treatment centers began to grow in the 1950s. By then, the public was aware of the issues with asylums. They were frequently overcrowded, and many patients experienced deplorable conditions. At the same time, several new psychiatric drugs became available. Doctors were able to sell politicians on the idea that these drugs would make it possible for previously institutionalized patients to live in the community. The research that led to deinstitutionalization began in the 1950s, but it wasn't until the 1960s that the federal and state governments passed laws which closed asylums en masse. The asylums were far from perfect. There were many cases of systematic mistreatment. 
One of the most horrifying examples was the Willowbrook State School in New York. Some institutions also practiced eugenics and sterilized patients. However, the facilities kept many people with mental illness off the streets, out of jail, and in relatively safe housing with access to treatment. The consequences of deinstitutionalization were not immediate. Many politicians were eager to save money by placing the responsibility of care onto communities and the federal government instead of the states. In the middle of the 20th century, people across the United States called for the closure of mental asylums. Stories of horrific abuse emerged from asylums nationwide, from the infamous Willowbrook State School in New York to the Topeka Insane Asylum in Kansas. Patients at certain asylums endured various forms of torture, including extended confinement and waterboarding, which was considered a cure at the time. Asylum administrators also often denied adequate food and clothing to their patients, and many facilities were understaffed. Though not every asylum mistreated patients, tragic stories upset the public, causing progressive groups to rail against the facilities. When mental institutions closed, many patients were unable to find work to support themselves and became homeless. Mental illness also frequently coincides with substance dependency, such as addictions to drugs, alcohol, or both. When patients were no longer looked after by a staff of nurses and doctors at a mental institution, they often turned to drugs and alcohol to self-medicate, which only worsened the effects of their mental illness and made it even more difficult to find a stable income and lifestyle. The problem, unfortunately, has not gotten much better. Today, about 20 to 25 percent of the homeless population suffers from a severe mental illness, and mental illness is the third largest cause of homelessness for single adults. When large mental asylums were still in use, the population of prisoners with mental illness was only about 1 percent in 1880. Once institutions began closing in the 1960s, the number started rising significantly. By the 1980s, around 10 percent of the imprisoned population suffered from severe mental illness. In 2012, New York Daily News dubbed the Los Angeles County Jail the largest de facto psychiatric inpatient facility in the U.S., with New York City's Rikers Island coming in second. The issue is that, for individuals with severe mental illness, prison is not the right solution. Placing them there puts an undue burden on law enforcement, who are not trained to handle patients with mental illness. Though the majority of people with mental illness are nonviolent, some incidents led to legislation requiring they get treatment. In 1999, a man named Andrew Goldstein pushed Kendra Webdale in front of a New York City subway train, killing her. He had failed to take his medication for diagnosed schizophrenia. After the incident, Kendra's law went into effect, which according to New York Daily News gave courts the power to compel the mentally ill to accept treatment as a condition of living in society. The law lets judges order the mental health system to treat those with severe mental illness. This potentially gives people access to mental health treatments. However, groups like the American Civil Liberties Union oppose Kendra's law and similar laws because this law unconstitutionally expands the circumstance under which the state may compel persons with neurobiological disorders to undergo treatments against his or her will. In 1963, John F. Kennedy signed the Community Mental Health Act. It essentially shifted the responsibility of caring for people with mental illness from the states to the federal government, which began to rely on community centers for patient care. The intention was to allow patients to remain at home and continue participating in society with community-based care, rather than via large institutions. It was an idealistic plan requiring a lot of follow-through by the federal government. Kennedy's assassination occurred less than a month after he signed the bill. The community programs never received stable funding, and people widely deemed the legislation a failure. In the 1950s and 60s, psychiatrists pushed community care for people with mental illness. Many psychiatrists realized moving away from or reforming the existing systems could prove too difficult 
so a community-based option seemed practical. Decades later, those who composed the legislation readily admitted the plan had numerous flaws. According to Dr. John A. Talbot, president of the American Psychiatric Association, the psychiatrists involved in the policymaking at that time certainly oversold community treatment, and our credibility today is probably damaged because of it. The legislation ordered the opening of community-run mental health centers, but psychiatrists recognized the lack of local resources to assume this responsibility, especially when state hospitals discharged patients quickly and unexpectedly. However, despite a lack of faith in the program, officials passed the Community Mental Health Act in 1963. Until the 1850s, people with mental illness in the United States were mostly on the streets and in jail cells. Facilities built throughout the following century provided many of them with a place to live, though the system was far from ideal. Today, the living conditions for Americans who need treatment are often shockingly similar to those preceding the 1850s, with many left homeless or in prison. When psychiatric facilities began to close, they left behind crumbling buildings. Some structures turned into schools or new hospitals, but many remain unused. The decaying buildings inspired many urban legends, such as the Cropsey story in Staten Island, New York. Kids told tales of an escaped patient from the closed Willowbrook School living in tunnels beneath the buildings. Cropsey supposedly kidnapped neighborhood kids. The stories held a grain of truth. In the 1980s, children went missing on Staten Island. The courts convicted a former orderly at Willowbrook named Andre Rand in several kidnapping cases, most involving children with mental disabilities. He camped in the woods around Willowbrook with former patients. He was a former employee at Willowbrook, as he was employed as a custodian there when it was an operation. I actually featured his story in an episode of Weird Darkness some time back. I'll place a link to that in the show notes. The chairman of the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee says the Pentagon and the public need to know more, not less, about UFOs. In 2020, Florida Senator Marco Rubio is one of several lawmakers to have received closed-door briefings from military officials about unknown objects flying in restricted airspace. Rubio was unaware of the existence of a secret Pentagon study of UFOs, or UAPs, until the New York Times and Politico reported about ATIP, the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, a multi-agency effort created to share information about UFO incidents involving military personnel or facilities. The December 2017 news report was accompanied by the released videos recorded by U.S. Navy pilots. One video, the so-called Tic Tac, was recorded off the coast of Southern California in 2004. The two other videos, dubbed Gimbal and Go Fast, were recorded in 2015 by Navy pilots operating in waters off Florida, Rubio's home state. The news stories set off an international wake of additional media coverage and prompted congressional members and senior staffers to ask for closed-door briefings. Staffers and elected members of the Intelligence and Armed Services Committees have received multiple briefings which included face-to-face -face meetings with military pilots and officials, along with statements from scientists who have worked as consultants to government-funded research programs. Rubio, who became chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee in 2020, and Vice Chairman Senator Mark Warner have both publicly acknowledged the briefings, but have said little about what was discussed at the time of this episode's recording. The three UFO videos were first released by the Pentagon at the request of former intelligence officer Lou Elizondo, who managed the ATIP program from 2010 until he left the military in 2017. Military officials subsequently re-released the videos in 2020. Elizondo told Mystery Wire there are many other videos recorded by military personnel, 
but those have not yet been made public. ATIP grew out of a larger program, AWSAP, or Advanced Aerospace Weapons System Applications Program, which was initiated in 2007 by Nevada Senator Harry Reid and two of his senior colleagues, Senators Daniel Inouye and Ted Stevens. AWSAP became operational in 2008 when the Defense Intelligence Agency DIA, signed a contract with a Las Vegas-based company, BASS, a subsidiary of Bigelow Aerospace. $22 million was allocated to the BASS effort, which investigated UFOs as well as a much broader range of related phenomena. When the funding for AWSAP was siphoned away by other Pentagon programs, the program, renamed ATIP, continued but with a smaller focus. In the nearly three years since the existence of ATIP and AWSAP were revealed, Pentagon spokespersons have continued to issue contradictory statements about the military study of UAPs. The Pentagon has both confirmed and denied that ATIP studied UFOs or UAPs. There have also been conflicting statements about Lou Elizondo's role with those programs. Members of Congress, along with journalists and the public, have been eager to clear up the inconsistencies and to find out what the military has learned about UFOs and UAPs. Elizondo is among several former ATIP and AWSAP personnel who have met with members of Congress and committee staff. Senator Marco Rubio has taken a leading role in trying to understand the extent of UAP incursions into American airspace, whether these appearances constitute a threat to national security and aviation safety, and whether foreign adversaries may have leapfrogged American technological superiority. In a new and exclusive interview, Senator Rubio talked about the Pentagon needing to get to the bottom of who or what is operating the mystery craft. The American public deserves to know as much as possible about it, Senator Rubio said while speaking with Next Star reporter Kelly Myers for Mystery Wire. And we shouldn't allow the stigma associated with the term UFO to keep us from trying to answer that question at the end of the day. These are things that are potentially endangering our national security and could cause an accident, you know, in terms of crashing into something that's up there. So I don't know what they are, and that's the problem. Since the briefings given to senators and their senior staff, Senator Rubio's Intelligence Committee has promoted an ongoing UFO study by the Pentagon that, according to the senator, has bipartisan support. I think it's certainly not a partisan issue. I think there's different levels of interest in it. Look, I mean, the stigma, it starts out with the fact that a lot of pilots for a long time wouldn't even report on these things because they were told not to. You need to go see the, you know, the, the flight surgeon to check your head. So people just decided, oh, you know, they're going to think I'm crazy, I'm not going to report on it. I think some of that seeps into the politics, and no one ever wants to be accused of being a person that's out there sort of chasing these things that have been the realm of science fiction for such a long time. Senator Rubio went on to explain specifically why the UFO question needs to be asked and studied. I remind everybody, I want you to put aside all that stuff that people talk about extraterrestrials and all that. This is a very simple equation for me. There are things flying over our military installations. We don't know what they are or where they're from. We don't know if it's some other country what's doing it, and we need to know the answer to that question. Simple. That's what it's about. I'm not going to speculate about what it is. I'm not going to try to guess. I'm not going to fall into all these traps and the conspiracy theories. We just need to know the answer to that question. One case which had received notoriety in the UK was the murder of Eve Stratford, aged just 21, which was remarkably linked to the murder of Lynn Whedon, aged just 16, after 30 years. In 2004, the two killings were discovered to have been committed by the same perpetrator using DNA testing. And so, two murders across different parts of a sprawling London were established to have been committed by a serial killer who for 40 years had been hiding in plain sight. 
Eve's murder occurred on the 18th of March, 1975, while Lynn's was almost six months after, on the 10th of September, 1975, both occurring in suburban London. There was also potential links to a third murder of Linda Farrow, who was killed in her home in January of that year, with many similarities to the other two. The three murders were all in the greater London area of Leighton, Hounslow, and Chigwell. The double murders occurred in 1975, and it is chilling to think that the killer has been possibly roaming free ever since. The case was reopened in 2007, but it's one of those that we really are not any closer to despite all of the years having passed. As of 2020, the case remains open. Eve Stratford had moved to Leighton with her boyfriend in 1972, having been raised by a German mother and English father in the Aldershot area of southern England. At the time of her death, Eve was working as a Playboy bunny in the Playboy Club of Park Lane, which had led to the unfortunate dubbing of the murderer as the Bunny Killer. Eve was also a centerfold for Mayfair magazine, an adult magazine, the piece had been released just days before her murder. Eve was found by her boyfriend at their flat in Leighton. Her throat had been cut multiple times, and a nylon stocking was tied to one ankle while she was bound with a scarf. Lynn's boyfriend at the time was Tony Priest, the lead singer of pop band Onyx, not to be confused with a 1990s hip-hop act. There is potential that Eve knew her killer. Neighbors were said to have heard muted conversation, followed by a bang with no discernible ruckus and no damage to suggest forced entry. There was semen found on Eve's clothes, and a bouquet of bloody flowers was next to her body when she was discovered. The police described the rape as likely, with police at the time being unable to rule out consensual sex. That might seem pragmatic on behalf of the detectives, but it also casts aspersions on the victim. This had all occurred around early evening, between 4 and 5 p.m., on March 18, 1975. One interesting theory was that the killer was a stalker that knew Eve's whereabouts and when she would be home alone. Bear in mind, she lived with three men. They could very possibly have disguised themselves as a flower delivery man, explaining the blood-soaked fresh bouquet. This theory was posted on many forums online, and should only be considered that a theory. Lynn's murder seemed a bit more random, but no less disgusting. A lot younger and less famous than Eve, Lynn was just a schoolgirl who was killed on her way home after 11 p.m. in September of that year, after an evening out with friends. Lynn was walking alone. It's believed by detectives that she was followed on foot from the Great Western Road through an alleyway called the Short Hedges where she was bludgeoned and thrown into the grounds of an electrical substation, a common eyesore in urban England. Lynn actually died a week later in a hospital from her injuries, which included blunt force trauma. It wasn't until the 21st century that the two were eventually linked together as being committed by the same person, which means that for over 40 years there's been a London serial killer that had fallen completely below the radar with two definite victims to his claim, and more potentially linked. While the British media may revel in glorifying these legendary gruesome figures of the night such as Jack the Ripper and Jack the Stripper, we shouldn't glamorize anybody capable of such foul intent by creating legends of elusive serial killers, and we should focus on the real tragedy, which was the innocent women's lives being cut short in their prime just to serve the pathetic needs of a sadistic psychopath. For better or for worse, this one flew completely under the radar of British media and their hysteria. Detective Chief Inspector Andy Mortimer from the Homicide and Serious Crime Command, quoted in 2007, said, "...advances in forensic science mean that we're able to relook at certain older cases with the very real possibility that some progress can be made that would not have been possible previously. As a result, we now have a DNA link between the murders of Eve and Lynn, who was just 16 at the time of her death. We believe the killer could have confided in someone over the years about what happened or might have even bragged about the murders. 
They've kept a dark secret for the last 30 years, and I'm sure they would have felt the need to share this burden with someone. We appeal to anyone who feels they might have some information, however seemingly unimportant, to come forward. Both murders were featured on the iconic BBC show Crime Watch in 2007, when the cold case was reopened. It is extremely likely that the killer knew Eve, and this was a strong hunch by detectives, however, with Lynn, it may have been a moment born out of savage opportunism. However, despite new appeals opening up seemingly every decade, there is nothing to note that stands out as having been revealed between the DNA discovery and present day. Linda Farrow, a casino croupier, was pregnant at the time of her death. She was seemingly stabbed with her head completely severed using a freezer knife. However, one thing that may rule out a connection to the other two is that the murder was not seemingly sexual. A man was seen running from the area at the time that was in their late 30s, 5'9", wearing a donkey jacket and Wellingtons. This occurred on Whitehall Road in Chingford, and a Ford Cortina was seen departing Whitehall Road around the time of the murder. From the description above, I think we can rule out Linda as being connected to the first two with people even suggesting the Yorkshire Ripper Peter Sutcliffe was linked to the crime. Yorkshire, however, is quite far from Chingford. The Met Police offered a £20,000 reward in connection to solving the case back in 2009. These cases do not age well. The leads seem almost non-existent at present, and despite the appearance of DNA and as people begin to die or simply forget, closure on such cases seems nearly impossible. There's a strong reality that the killer himself is already dead. Two linked murders and a serial killer seemingly loose in 1975 London, and it regrettably took 40 years to even connect the killings and shed light on the fact that a serial killer had been walking the streets of London and getting away with it for such a long time. While Britain has a lurid and disturbing history of crime, and they have some of the most infamous serial killers on record. Here was one operating in such a savage and predatory nature, and nobody even knew he existed. However, in a world of increasing technological advancement and avid interest in true crime, a day of reckoning may eventually come for Eve, Lynn, and Linda. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. In November 1565, a married teenaged girl named Nicole Aubrey began experiencing physical torments that she claimed had been brought on by a vision of her dead grandfather. A native of Vervins, France, the 15-year-old Nicole had become so sick that she could not eat and reportedly went into such contortions that, as one eyewitness would later describe, 
12 or 15 men were needed to hold her down. She also spoke in a gruff and frightening voice and claimed that the spirit of her grandfather was possessing her. The grandfather told her that he had died without confessing and instructed Nicole and her family to carry out various penances as a result. Despite the family doing what was requested, the possession continued. Nicole's family arranged for a Dominican priest, Pierre de Lamotte, to exorcise her. Through repeated exorcisms, de Lamotte managed to get the possessing spirit to confess that it was a devil rather than an angel. Nicole's possession became worse, and she became deaf, blind, and mute, to make her unable to take communion. Also, the chief devil possessing her reportedly invited numerous other devils to come in to possess her body as well. According to reports, de Lamont drove out 28 of the demons possessing Nicole, after which they fled to Geneva, which was the center of the Calvinist movement at the time. The chief demon possessing her, who named himself Beelzebub, the prince of the Huguenots – Huguenots were French Protestants – insisted that no one less than the Bishop of Léon could drive him out. When Bishop Jean de Bourges arrived in Vervins in January 1566 to do an exorcism, he was no more successful than the other priests. The case quickly took on political dimensions, with the local Huguenots insisting that the entire possession story was a hoax and attempted to have the exorcisms stopped. They had good reason for their skepticism, considering the Beelzebub was accusing them of consorting with Satan. Largely for her own protection, Nicole was transferred to Léon, where she was subjected to a series of public exorcisms which took on all the pomp of a religious pageant. Each day, Nicole was taken from the convent, where she was staying in a great religious procession, to the majestic Cathedral Notre-Dame de Léon, where she mounted a specially constructed scaffold. There, before a large audience, the exorcist would order Prince Beelzebub to speak, and Nicole would dutifully deliver a sermon on the evils that the Protestants would inflict on France's Catholics. The content was little different from the anti-Huguenot sermons that priests and bishops across the country were delivering on a daily basis. That a demon, one of Satan's fallen, was telling the Catholics who were listening what they largely wanted to believe about their Huguenot neighbors seemed guaranteed to boost religious tensions. Among other things, Prince Beelzebub told his listeners that local Huguenots had stolen a communion wafer, cut it up, and burned the pieces. Beelzebub also boasted that, I, with my obstinate Huguenots, will do him, Christ, more evil than the Jews did. According to one Catholic chronicler describing Nicole Aubrey's public exorcisms, the Catholics in great joy gave thanks to God, being more confirmed in their faith. While some Huguenots returned to the way of salvation, others became more and more stubborn, mocking the entire preceding thing. That Huguenots continued to insist that the entire spectacle was a hoax, perpetrated by the church using a gullible young girl, did nothing to ease tensions. On February 8, 1566, the miracle of Léon occurred when the Bishop of Léon held up a communion wafer and drove out the last of the demons from Nicole's body. Nothing more seems to have been recorded about Nicole, and she faded into obscurity afterward. The Léon miracle helped reinforce anti-Protestant attitudes, with Catholic clergy spreading the word across Europe to become one of the rallying points of the Counter-Reformation. It also played an important role in the religious holy wars that racked France during the 16th century. That included the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in August 1572, in which thousands of Huguenots were killed. The French wars of religion would drag on until the end of the 16th century and would eventually lead to the expulsion of the Huguenots from France. One of the most intriguing descriptions of Nicole's possession was how she was able to speak without the apparent use of her vocal cords. According to Jean Boulez, who wrote the most well-known description of Nicole and her possession, speaking in Nicole with her mouth open wide enough to allow the passage of a walnut and with a swelling beneath the throat, or to be more exact, in the throat beneath the chin, but in any case without either making use or moving the lips, the grandfather replied loudly in a cracked voice 
I am from God, who endured death and suffering for us all from the Virgin Mary and all the saints of paradise. I am the soul of Joaquin Willett. Though Nicole had initially insisted that her grandfather's spirit was using her body with her conscious cooperation, she was later forced to revise this to be more in keeping with Catholic doctrine. Since doctrine didn't allow for the existence of good spirits using living people to pass on messages, their interrogation shaped her response to conform with church views on demonic possession. Given her desire to please her interrogators, the anti-Protestant message she delivered hardly seems that surprising. Along with spurring the anti-Huguenot mania gripping France, Nicole Opry's possession also became influential in terms of inspiring copycat cases of possession. In the French city of Soissons, four people were publicly exercised in 1582. One of these, a 13-year-old boy named Laurent, was reportedly possessed by a demon calling himself Benoit. Another possessee was more unusual since he was a 50-year-old man who managed to be possessed twice. Repossessed? A third case was more unusual still since it was a woman named Marguerite Aubry, no relation, who claimed to be possessed by the same Beelzebub who had possessed Nicole Aubry years before. Though the Soissons possessions were never as well known as Nicole Aubry's case, there were numerous similarities. All of the possessees went into convulsions whenever holy relics were placed on their stomach or when they were forced to drink holy water. And like Nicole Aubry, they accused the local Huguenots of various religious crimes. The demons reportedly claimed that they had come to give comfort to their Huguenot friends but were forced to recognize the power of the true church during the public exorcism which drove them out. The last great possession case of the 16th century was Martha Brozier, who apparently became convinced that she was possessed after reading about Nicole Aubrey's case. Beginning in 1598, Martha's family carried her from town to town in the Loire Valley where she received multiple public exorcisms. This continued for over a year before French authorities had her arrested out of fear that she would stir up anti-Huguenot prejudice. Martha either escaped or was helped to escape and returned to seeking out exorcisms, this time in southern France. Despite traveling to Rome and appealing to the Vatican, Martha was diagnosed as suffering from illness rather than being truly possessed. According to the various doctors and theologians who examined her, Her condition was a Latin phrase which translates to nothing from the demon, much invention, a little from illness. Though the age of possession was hardly over, there would be other cases throughout the 17th and 18th centuries that Nicole Aubrey exorcism and others like it became a central plank in the propaganda war being waged by the Catholic Church against Protestant movements. The miracle of Léon would be part of Catholic tradition long after the political turmoil that inspired it died down. That exorcism and cases of demonic possession are still with us today in many societies demonstrates its popularity as a tool for propping up belief systems being threatened by skepticism. How effective that tool is depends on the willingness of people to believe the unbelievable. Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast, please tell someone about it. Recommend Weird Darkness to your friends, family, and co-workers who love the paranormal, horror stories, or a true crime like you do. Every time you share the podcast with someone new, it helps spread the word about the show, and a growing audience makes it possible for me to keep doing the podcast. Plus, telling others about Weird Darkness also helps get the word out about resources that are available for those who suffer from depression. So please share the podcast with someone today. Do you have a dark tale to tell of your own? Fact or fiction, click on Tell Your Story on the website and I might use it in a future episode. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Mysterious humanoids existed with people millenniums ago 
was written by A. Sutherland for AncientPages.com. The Unexpected Consequences of Forced Closure of Mental Asylums was written by Rachel Sowerby for Ranker.com. The Murdered Bunny and Forgotten Serial Killer was by Kieran W. for Mystery Confidential. UFOs, National Security, and Marco Rubio was written by George Knapp for MysteryWire.com. And The Possession of Nicole Aubrey was written by Dr. Romeo Vitelli for Providentia. We're Darkness Theme by Alibi Music. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Psalm 34, verse 14. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. And a final thought, don't compare your progress with that of others. We all need our own time to travel our own distance. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.